very much for making time to, to be here this morning for a conversation about COVID and how should a doctor advise a rabbi, which really is, you'll see, going to be in two parts. There's going to be, should a doctor advise a rabbi and how should a doctor advise a rabbi, both of which we need to, to talk about. Um, this is the first program in this academic year for our Nussbaum Family Medical Ethics and Halacha program. Um, thank you to the Nussbaum family for dedicating the uh, the program. And I want to give special thanks as well to Dr. Barry Pekis for um, shepherding this through the accreditation process that we were able to get CME credit for, for the year once again. Um, that is a job which seems to become more complicated and more challenging every year. So uh, thank you very much, Barry, for, uh, for, for all of your, your help and work in that regard and for making the series better on the whole in that process. Um, I never ask for advanced registration for the session because, you know, inevitably things come up. A person signs up, can't make it, whatever. So um, what that means is that I'd like to ask people to sign in via the chat, whether you send a message just to me, that's fine, or, um, or whether you just post it in the chat. Either way is fine, but... Um, certainly, if you want CME credit, we need to have you register as being present. Um, but even if you don't, if you just want to make sure that uh, you're on the email list for follow-up from this session, notification about future sessions, um, I will need you to uh, to sign in. Um, our, our next medical ethics session actually isn't for a little while. Um, the way the calendar worked out for the medical ethics and legal ethics, um, legal ethics ends up getting uh, November and December because they need their year-end credit, and it ends in <laughs> January 1. So legal ethics will be November and December. And then we're back in January. I think it's January 11th for our next session in the medical ethics series, and that will also be COVID-related. Um, infection control for the doctor and dentist. We'll be dealing with protocols. We'll be dealing with the question of reporting obligations. Um, what happens if protocol was breached, but there is no actual infection, and so on. So... Um, I see people signing up in the chat. That's good. Thank you. Um, if people could continue to do so, that that would be great. Um, also, um, God willing, after the session, you will receive an email with a link for a brief evaluation. The evaluations are important to make sure that the series meets your needs, um, as well as to uh, yeah, to make sure that we are able to get accreditation. That's a requirement. So. Um, when you get that, if you can fill that out, uh, greatly appreciate it. Even if you're m not a medical professional, they want you to fill it out. Just skip the parts that ask about like how this is going to change your medical practice. Um, okay, I am muting people by default um, to begin with, but I would like people to please unmute themselves to make you know, make comments, ask questions uh, in the course of the session. I much prefer if people um, put their questions aloud as opposed to writing them in the chat, because I don't like to have to monitor the chat as well as the, uh, the discussion. That becomes more complicated. Okay, so if people don't have the, um, the source sheet, um, I am now, again, putting the link in the, uh, in the chat for you to be able to download it. Um, it's the same one that I, that I emailed out. Um, the agenda is right at the top of the source sheet. Jewish law relies on rabbis to explain how its laws apply to a given situation. But the rabbis rely on experts to define the situation itself. But in dealing with the novel coronavirus, or even more routine matters like elective surgery, end-of-life care, the medical facts are often unclear, and rabbinic guidance based on unclear data may prove dangerous. How should medical professionals respond when rabbis seek their advice regarding uncertain situations? And the truth of the matter is that as things played out, we ended up being much broader than this agenda in terms of what uh, I hope to cover in the session. But that's one of the key um, issues is unclear data. Um, so by the end of this session, participants will understand the indications for medical or rabbinic consultation, appreciate the professional and personal boundaries of medical and rabbinic consultation and the definition of expertise, and have a framework for communication around medical and halachic issues that relate to novel or unknown situations. So yes, we are ambitious. Um, let's, see, uh, let's see how much we can, uh, we can accomplish of that. Um, what I want to do 
is, as I said, first deal with the question of should a doctor advise a rabbi, meaning if you haven't been asked, uh, and then after that deal with so how exactly does a doctor advise a, uh, a rabbi. And this topic was actually requested explicitly by various doctors, implicitly by others in discussing COVID issues since this past March. Um, it's a big topic, and I need to give four disclaimers, which I think is a record number of disclaimers for me when starting a, uh, a session. The first one is a standard one. It applies to all of my uh, medical ethics and halacha discussions, and, um, and it certainly applies to, uh, to this session. And that is that nothing that I say here um, is intended as psak, as giving you know, practical halachic guidance. Our topics are very fuzzy. Um, they don't lend themselves to straight answers. Um, I see value in our discussion and the general sense as we get from our sources. But if someone is dealing with a, with a specific circumstance, you got to go to your halachic authority to ask for a uh, for a psak, for a for a ruling. That's number one. Number two, um, since we're dealing with issues which are very live in our community, um, I want to make sure to note none of our vignettes, none of our cases comes from a particular situation or event um, in our community. They're hypotheticals meant to present our questions. So if you recognize somebody in it, it's completely, you know, out of your mind, not out of mine. I didn't put that in there. Um, the, a third disclaimer, um, when dealing with issues of uh, medical opinion about masks, distancing, and so on, um, I'm going with what I understand to be mainstream medical opinion. Um, I recognize that there are doctors who are in the mainstream on this. There are doctors who are not necessarily uh, in line with the mainstream on it, but I am not credentialed to have a discussion on, number one, what qualifies as appropriate medical guidance. That's for the doctors to do. Um, that's number one. And number two, it's really a different shear. In other words, the issue of what constitutes appropriate medical advice is a topic of discussion in Jewish law. It's just not the topic of discussion for this morning in Jewish law. We actually have a session planned, I think, for February on alternative medicine, and there we can get into more of the discussion of what constitutes mainstream medicine in the eyes of Jewish law. But what I'm going to be stipulating for the sake of our conversation today is that masks and social distancing are standard medical advice. Okay. Um, and finally, my fourth disclaimer um, when I say doctor in this conversation, um, I mean medical professional. I mean anyone who is trained and certified to practice in a relevant medical field. That's what I mean. So this may include nurses, this may include pharmacists, this includes a range of medical professionals. Often I just use doctor as shorthand. So if you take a look on the sheet at source number one, and because people keep on signing in and uh, I, they don't see the chat that preceded them, I just put the link for the sheet once more in the uh, in the chat. This is um, from an interview with Rabbi Dr. Aaron Glatt. Uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar, uh, he's an expert in, infect in infectious diseases in New York. Um, he is also an ordained rabbi. And um, he actually serves two congregations, which in and of itself is a trick. And it's just a short interview done by the newspaper Newsday in New York, in which he comments, the Torah position is exactly in accord with the medical position. Do everything possible to prevent yourself from getting sick. Because once you get sick, it's much more difficult to get better. Okay, I recognize that that's very profound. The um, once you get sick, it's much harder to get better. This is certainly true, um, and uh, and and I think relatively straightforward. But what he's presenting here, saying the Torah wants you to avoid getting sick, um, the um, you know he's he's giving you advice as a rabbi and also as a doctor because that's something that he is credentialed to do. But in our communities, it's a lot harder because rabbi and doctor are actually separate people. Um, the rabbi doesn't have the medical knowledge. The doctor doesn't have the halachic authority. Rabbi doctors are pretty rare. 
Um, and so there is a need, in order for halachic decisions to be made properly, there's a need for the rabbi and the doctor to work in tandem. And what we're talking about here is, how does that actually happen, and particularly in a situation like what we're dealing with in a COVID crisis. So, let's get started on the actual uh, the actual cases. So, our first case is in source number two. In the past, I used to... Um, I used to read out all the vignettes in the beginning, but the more I the more I've seen, the more I think, you know what? Let's just go case by case here. So vignette number one is in source two on your sheet, relatively straightforward. A family practitioner becomes concerned that the personal practices of synagogue members are increasing the likelihood of their contracting COVID-19. What, if anything, should she say to the synagogue's rabbi? Right? This is under the first topic that I mentioned before of should a doctor advise a rabbi before we get to how should. Should a doctor advise a rabbi? What, if anything, should this, uh, this family practitioner say expressing her concern? Opening, the, opening this to you, what would you say? Um, so some of you are trying to speak, but you're muted. You're going to have to unmute. So, so Andrea says, doctor has an obligation to speak up, not just to the rabbi, but to people in general. Rose, what were you going to say? Well, I think we absolutely do have a responsibility. We have a, a medical responsibility and a moral responsibility. And actually, uh, I think that a lot of uh, synagogues in these even circumstances set up committees to deal with these issues because it is a responsibility that we have as a society. Right. So, you are quite correct that synagogues have set up these committees. I think they're great, and I think it's an acknowledgement that the rabbi needs the doctor's advice um, in order to be able to, to guide the institution properly. And so what, what I'm hearing is doctors do have a, uh, a duty to speak up, a duty to, to be involved when they see that something is going on that they believe is unsafe. I heard it worded as a general obligation, a professional obligation, as well as a moral one. We'll have to talk about this in a Jewish context. That's part of why we're here. Dr. Kirshen. I just wanted to ask, why doesn't Hochev Tochiach require me to first talk to the individual or individuals, plural, who are, quote, misbehaving? Good. So that's an interesting question. Dr. Kirshen takes us to the next step and wants to know, we're talking here about going to the rabbi, what about going to the person? In other words, how do you approach this? So, you know, my simple answer would be that what I envisioned in creating this, this vignette is not um, Dr. X going to the rabbi and saying, I saw so-and-so doing something inappropriate, but rather, I know this is going on in the community, and then it's up to the rabbi to make proclamations not to go to the targeted individual. And therefore, it's not a matter of embarrassing the person or, you know, shouldn't I go to them personally as opposed to going to somebody else. However, some of this will go back to the point that Andrea made, which is before you talk about speaking to the rabbi, there is potentially a duty to speak to the person involved as well because you have a responsibility towards them. And in that sense, it will apply. Um, Sam, you were going to say? A couple of things. First is, if you're talking about a specific person, that may be easy. But if you're talking about a congregation where several people uh, follow the rabbi uh, approach, I will take it one step further, and I don't know whether you're going to comment on this. What if the doctor approaches the oilum and the rabbi, but the rabbi minimizes the advice of the doctor and doesn't go mainstream? Right. So we that's a great question. We are going to deal with that in source number 14. 
So, um, so that, that, that is very much a, uh, a good question. And, um, and we'll have to come back to it. So let's talk a little bit in terms of Jewish sources on this. I am going to deal with some of the secular issues and sources as well. But just anchoring it in, in, in Torah, take a look at source number three, where I gave you five bullet points, just because I did not feel like, um, exhausting our source sheet space on the sources which we've discussed many times before. So I just bulleted it for you. But if anybody wants, I can send you the full sources. The Torah teaches us, love your neighbor as yourself, which we are under, which we understand to mean not simply an emotional feeling, but rather a duty to invest our energies in helping others. The Rambam, in the beginning of the 14th chapter of Hilchos Avo, Laws of Mourning, says the mitzvot that we think of as standard mitzvot in Judaism, like visiting the sick and looking after them, uh, taking care of people uh, before a wedding, before a funeral, Rachman al-Aslan, all of those things, all come under, love your neighbor as yourself. So I have to help others. We have a mitzvah, lo sa'amod al dam reyecha, do not stand by while somebody's blood is shed, which we understand, the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, gives us a proactive duty to intervene if we believe somebody's health is in danger. Vashevo solo, the Torah says that if you see that somebody's property is uh, is in danger. You have a responsibility to help preserve it, to restore the property to that person. And the Gemara says that that includes an obligation to look after the person's health. If you have to worry about their property, how much more so you have to worry about their person. We have a mitzvah, which Dr. Kirshen mentioned, hocheach tochiach es amisecha, also known as tochacha, instruction or rebuke. You have a responsibility to instruct people if you know that they're doing something wrong. And uh, mind your own business is not a Jewish idea. The, um, and then there's also a, a concept of the lifnei iver lo sitein michshol, do not put a stumbling block in front of the blind, which on a simple level I would say means don't actively harm people. However, Rabbi Yaakov Breish, the, uh, the Chelkes Yaakov and others have argued that actually there's a responsibility um, to not let people stumble as well. If you know somebody is going to do something that's going to cause them harm, then you have a responsibility to uh, to intervene. You can't be be silent. So based on all of these, it seems like there is a basic duty to rescue in Judaism. That stands in contrast to Ontario law. Ontario law does not have, in general, a duty to rescue. As a matter of fact, I think the only province in Canada that has a duty to rescue is Quebec. Um, however... We're going to come back to applying that to doctors because doctors have often what's called a special relationship in which there may be a duty to rescue. We're going to have to talk about that. That's that's uh, something we have to we have to come back to. But in Judaism, certainly there is a duty to rescue. Having said that, having said that Judaism establishes a responsibility to rescue others, there are reasons why a non-doctor would not necessarily be bound to intercede. In other words, somebody who's not a medical professional could say, who am I, right? Torchiner. Torchiner knows because he's read articles. You're supposed to wear a mask. You're supposed to social distance. Fine. I'm walking down the street and I see two people who are not in a bubble with each other. And I see that they're standing talking face to face. Under what we've just said, I should say something. I should do something. And yet, you could argue that not. I'm not a doctor. Therefore, I'm not bound to intercede. Number one, because the duty to rescue is founded upon the assumption that there is an act that I am able to perform which has a chance of saving the other party. Right? Meaning, if you have somebody who can't swim and they see somebody drowning, so their duty to rescue may include calling 911, flagging down a passing car, or whatever, but if they can't swim, they shouldn't be jumping into the tide. They're just going to make things worse. So if you don't have the ability to assist, then you don't necessarily intervene. The, um, you know, maybe the fact that you're wearing a mask and you're distancing is in and of itself you, uh, you doing your part, especially because I find it hard to believe that there is anybody in Toronto who does not already have access to the messages about masking and social distancing. If a person is is not observing masking and social distancing, it's a decision. 
it's not ignorance at this uh, at this stage. I see your hand, Rose. Just let me let me complete this slot, and then I'll come to you. If you take a look at source number four, you find this brought in Jewish law in the commentaries of Tosfot to the Gemara in Shabbos. The the Gemara there is a very important Gemara. We're going to come back to it in greater detail. But what the Gemara there states is that there is a duty for people to intervene when they see wrongdoing, and even if they believe no one is going to listen. That's the Gemara's statement. And Tosos writes on that, take a look at source number four, this, meaning the obligation to intervene, is where one does not know whether they will accept. As the Talmud says, is it obvious to them that others won't listen? You don't know whether people will listen or not. But where they definitely will not accept, leave them. Better for them to sin accidentally than intentionally. In other words, he's saying, don't convert people from accidental violators to intentional ones. Now, here you could argue, people are not doing this by accident, because they already know that it's wrong. And that's number one. Number two, there are limitations on that rule of better for people to sin accidentally than intentionally, because we say that rule does not apply if they're violating an explicit law in the Torah, like, say, preserving your life. So there are limits to what Tosvos is saying here. Nonetheless, sometimes the argument can be made that there's no reason for me to intervene because people already know and they're not listening anyway. Then the response comes back the other way, so then find another way to try to, uh, to, try to get them to, to follow. To, to follow what they're supposed to be doing. But point number one here is, a regular layperson may say, yes, I have a duty to get involved, but I'm not going to be effective, so therefore better for me to stand back. Rose, you were going to say? So it's a, it's a double-edged sword because you still have a moral responsibility to society. So if you see somebody not wearing a mask and you say nothing, or they're wearing it incorrectly or whatever, they are going to harm not only it's not themselves, they're going to harm society because assuming they so do we not have a moral responsibility it's like the act of omission versus the act of commission. To stand by and see harm done is the same as doing the harm. So I'm not sure I would equate it with doing the harm, but I think that that's, that's the question we're asking here omission. is what is the extent? It's the same, but it's still, it's like standing by and watching somebody hurt someone else and not doing anything. Right. Laya, what were you going to say? Uh, hi, um, I just, I think, I think there would be a difference there between a lay person saying something and as a doctor or even a rabbi, um, because I think I agree with you, Rabbi Kinchino. A lot of people have made up their mind. Um, I've had people say this is a hoax. Um, you know, this is all made up. It's not real. And um, so when I tell people something, I say I'm a doctor. I've seen what the worst case scenario is. I've seen people unable to breathe. You are putting us in danger. So I, I use my profession to try and hopefully make a difference. But as a lay, and as a rabbi, I think maybe, you know, say halakhically this is wrong. So I think you would have a stance as well. But as a lay person, maybe it would be harder to change that person's mind. Right. So, so I'm going to come back to the point you're raising, which is an important one. The idea that if you have a professional capacity that relates to the issue, maybe that does change the way people will relate to you and therefore increase your responsibility. I am going to come back to that because I think you're right. Um, I also wanted to note, though, one other potential limit on the duty to intervene, which is the matter of proximity, meaning... Tell me that I have a responsibility when I'm davening at a minion and I see somebody not being masked. That's one thing. Maybe expand that to I'm walking down the street and I see somebody I don't even know and they're not masked properly. But now, how far do you go? I hear accounts all the time about Jewish communities or why, why stop at Jews? People in general who are not observing this. Do I now have a responsibility to travel from place to place with a billboard? The, um, you know, I saw something terrible. There was a, uh, at the corner of Bathurst and Steeles, there was uh, like an RV parked uh, one day last week with an electronic billboard with a sign on it saying the Moderna vaccine is coming. It will steal your soul. It will sabotage your DNA. 
it was it was the most bizarre thing. The um, but do I have responsibility to actually go around with an RV with a digital billboard saying wear masks, social distance, so that the world gets the uh, the message? The uh, I'm going to answer this one just in the interest of time and say there has to be a limit to your responsibility, and I refer you to the law of prika utiina. There's a mitzvah in the Torah that if I see somebody with an animal and the animal is loaded up with a burden and the animal is struggling under the burden, I should help. I have to help him unload the animal. I have to help him load the animal. There are, there are responsibilities that I have to assist. However, in source number five, I brought you the Gemara in Bava Mitzia, which says the Torah frames this mitzvah of intervening. It introduces it by saying when you see at one point, and then separately, it, it, it frames it as when you encounter. What's the difference between seeing and encountering? Encountering is something nearby, something that is immediate. And the Gemara says that that phrase, when you encounter kisifga in the Hebrew, teaches that there is a distance obligation. I only have to intervene if it's close by. Now, the distance there that they mention is seven and a half mil. Seven and a half mil, a mil is approximately a kilometer. So it's still relatively nearby. So, I mean, at relatively distant, seven and a half kilometers. But the point is, there is a sense that you don't have to go looking for trouble. The, um, when you see trouble, intervene. You don't have to go looking for it. But again, this goes back to the regular person. Let's now talk about the medical professional. Within Judaism, we are taught that medical professionals are expected to use their knowledge to heal others. We had a session a couple of years ago on the question of whether a medical professional is allowed to charge for medical advice. Is that even permitted? Because there's a mitzvah of assisting others. If you have that information, you should be sharing it. If you take a look at source number six from the Shulchan Aruch, by Yosef Karo states, a doctor may not take payment for knowledge and teaching. He may take payment for strain and effort. There are things that you have to do that you're allowed to charge for. The fact that you devote yourself to healing others and therefore you're not making a mint in the stock market. So you're entitled to say, I need a parnasa. I need to be able to, uh, to support my family. Fine. You're allowed to charge for supplies. You can charge for the rental of your office space. If anyone has office space anymore, the, um, you're allowed to, to charge for that sort of thing, but to charge for the advice is inappropriate. Now we talked again, we had a whole session on this. This wasn't like a short discussion, but my point in bringing the source is to, to try to show that generally speaking, it is expected that the, from a Jewish standpoint, that the physician is going to use medical knowledge in order to assist others. And in general, a, prof a professional in any given field has the authority to be able to do that, right? Your words are taken more seriously as an expert in the field. Your speech and your silence are both interpreted as actions because you have the expertise, because you have the professional status. It goes back to that Gemara and Shabbos that I mentioned before which I'm going to now um, walk you through. If you take a look at source number seven, this is a piece of it. It's explaining verses in the prophet Yechezkel, in which first we are told that there's going to be a plague, and the plague is going to, uh, is going to strike everyone. And then we are told that the plague is act actually, sorry, it's only going to strike those who have sinned. And then we're told actually it's going to start with those who are the holy ones. The plague is going to start with those who are the holy ones. And the Talmud asks, what happened? Why, why the change? First, they were going to be saved, and now they're actually the first ones to suffer. And the Gemara says, it's actually because they did not intervene. When they saw people doing something wrong, they did not intervene. If you take a look at source number seven, I'm working with my English translation in the interests of time, but you can see the original Hebrew as well. It describes a debate going on among God's attributes. The trait of justice said before God, why are you sparing the righteous? What's the difference between these and those? And God says, well, these are completely righteous. Those are completely wicked. To which the response comes, yeah, but they ought to have protested. And they didn't do so. 
To which God says, yeah, because I know that had they protested, the people wouldn't have accepted it. To which justice says back, to you it's clear. You know that no one would have listened. They don't know that no one would have listened. And my point in bringing the story is to say, those who have a voice to be able to speak, those who are the leaders, face an extra responsibility to actually speak up. And we see this in the secular system as well. The, um, I actually, after I prepared the source sheet, I found a whole bunch more sources that I wanted to put on the source sheet. And I may even send out an expanded version when I do the follow-up from this, uh, from this class, the follow-up email. I didn't want to start putting out two different versions of the source sheet. That just creates confusion. But there's a lot to be said about this topic. In source number eight, I brought you from uh, regarding lawyers from a, uh, a verdict in Canadian courts. They're dealing with there with the issue of lawyers advertising for themselves and lawyers speaking to the media. And take a look at source number eight. A lawyer has a moral, civic, and professional duty to speak out where he sees an injustice. Furthermore, lawyers are, by virtue of their education, training, and experience, particularly well-equipped to provide information and stimulate reason, discussion, and debate on important current legal issues and professional practices, dot, dot, dot. In other words, lawyers have a duty to speak out. They have the, the skills. They have the knowledge to be able to stimulate important discussion on matters of justice and injustice. That's the lawyer side of things. It's true also for the doctors. Take a look at source number nine, an article from The Guardian that appeared in April dealing with the doctor in Wuhan who spoke out or who wanted to speak out and, uh, and was killed. Central to the art of doctoring is observation. Physicians see disease and destitution in clinics and hospitals. They interview and listen and trace illness back to family histories and living situations and environment. They advise politicians and government agencies with data and science. For many centuries, this has led doctors to speak out against the powers that be, demanding that they treat at the source. And that's something that that is very strong within uh, society. There's been debate historically about doctors speaking out about what is seen as non-medical issues. In, uh, in June of 2018, there was a, uh, a, an article that appeared in Forbes magazine entitled, Doctors Need to Shut Up More, by a healthcare writer. He was fed up with doctors weighing in on nuclear disarmament. Then there was a response, which appeared in the American journal Pediatrics, saying, no, doctors need to speak up more. Just the opposite. Doctors need to actually uh, speak up more. We want them to be to be heard. But that was on a general topic with a relatively limited um, role for, let's say, for a uh, for a standard medical practitioner. When you're dealing with medical topics, and certainly in Canada, there is a tradition of physician advocacy. I found an article by a Dr. Neil Arya in the Canadian Medical Association Journal who talked about this uh, advocacy as medical responsibility. And that's one of the articles that I want to show you um, when I do a a follow-up on this. Someone sent me a message in the chat, even though I'm trying not to monitor the chat, um, asking, is this like actors and basketball players talking about politics? So the answer is that's clearly what the writer in Forbes had in mind. I think that's what that that is what he had in mind. But I would venture to say that a doctor has more to say about nuclear disarmament than uh, than than random person on the street has to say about politics. The, well, maybe not. I take that back. I shouldn't say that. The um, but I'm dealing with the doctors now. I'm not dealing with the the the, the NBA ethics class for basketball players will have to be at a later date. Um, but. Is anyone here familiar with, I'm kind of assuming you are, the Charles Tupper Award? Sir Charles Tupper Award? Uh Uh-oh. So the Sir Charles Tupper Award um, has been given out by the Canadian Medical Association annually since 2002. It's an award for political advocacy. And the criteria for this includes, quote, current, active, and effective participation in grassroots advocacy... Examples of involvement in activities could be meeting regularly with MPs, attending local riding events and fundraisers, coordinating or hosting MP activities. So 
the idea of physician advocacy is, I think, something valued within um, within society. It's something that uh, is valued by the uh, by the CMA. Um, and um, hang on one second, I have to answer somebody. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. There you go. The um, so I take that as uh, as support then. Thank you. So what we're talking about here is a special duty for physicians, not just physicians have a relationship with their patients and have to advocate for them, but beyond that, advocate within society. So what I'm what I'm arguing here is that number one, there's a general duty within Judaism, which doesn't exist in Ontario, but exists in Judaism, a duty to rescue. Number two, there are the duties of a doctor expected to use the doctor's knowledge to heal others and supported within the secular system. And then I'll add a third point, which is strongly found in Judaism. You could argue it's found in secular society as well, which is that doctors present as role models. There's a term that the Gemara uses called Adam Chashuv, a person of standing. We are very, very concerned in Judaism about the possibility of misleading others. The um, examples include Pinchas and Zimri. Pinchas gets involved with a Midianite woman. The uh, Not Pinchas, excuse me. Zimri gets involved with a Midianite woman. The um, Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, stands up against the prophets of the, uh, the Baal. Um, we, have, we have strong concerns about misleading other people, and the opposite, the duty for a person of standing to make sure that they lead others properly, to make sure to guide others properly. So that, I brought you an example in sources 10 and 11, where the Talmud discusses um, a story involving Rav Nachman, without getting into the story at length, because we don't have the time to do it at length. Basically, Rav Nachman had a relative who had made a financial decision during her marriage that was going to deprive her of her, uh, of her, her and her, and her heirs of her ketubah payment. That was the decision she made at the time. The relative passed away, and now the relative's daughter is out of luck. Rav Nachman says, I have a way for her to take care of this. There's something she can do that will reverse her mother's decision, and then she'll be able to keep her money. And so Rav Nachman gives her the advice, and she follows the advice. It's all there in source number 10, for those who want to see the specifics. And um, and she ends up saving the ketubah money. Rav Nachman then feels bad, and he says, you know, we're not supposed to be, judges are not supposed to act like lawyers. Judges are not supposed to really advocate like this. So the Talmud asks, then why'd you get involved in the first place? So he says, well, at first I thought, family member. You have to act for family. But then I thought, yeah, but if you're a person of standing in the community, that can mislead people. It's inappropriate to get uh, to get involved. People will misunderstand the lesson and do things that are inappropriate. So that's an example of somebody saying, I shouldn't have acted because I'm a person of standing. But I'll give you the easy example of people who should act and who didn't, and it had disastrous results. Do you remember the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa? Does that ring a bell? Classic story from the Gemara in Gittin, taught usually at the time of Tisha B'av, which is unfortunate because it has ramifications all year long. It shouldn't be a Tisha B'av story. But in brief, the, uh, the story goes that there was a, a man who made a big, big party, and he had a friend, and he had an enemy. His friend's name is Kamsa. His enemy's name is Bar Kamsa. I'm not going into all the ins and outs of the story. But he makes the big party. And he has his servant invite everybody. And the servant makes a mistake. And instead of inviting the friend Kamsa, he invites the enemy Bar Kamsa. Host sees Bar Kamsa there at the feast. Says, get out of my feast. He, he apologizes. He says, please, just I'll pay for my food. Not interested. I'll pay for the uh, half the meal. Not interested. I'll pay for the entire meal. 
You get all the credit. You had a big feast and I'll pay for the whole thing. Nothing doing. The host, who was very happy to invite people via a third party, when it comes to throwing people out, he does it himself. He picks them up and he throws them out of the, uh, out of the party. And Barkamsa says, you know, all the sages were sitting there at the party and they didn't do anything. That shows that they're good with this. They're okay with it. And he comes up with a system that endangers all of the Jews. He comes up with a strategy. He tells the Romans the Jews are rebelling. He convinces them that it's true, leading the Romans to attack Jerusalem. In the course of the story, there's a sage of, by the name of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis in the follow-up discussion among the sages. I'm not going into the ins and outs right now. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai later says, Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis led to the destruction of the temple. And it's not clear from the story how he led to the destruction of the temple. However, when you read the version of the story that appears in the Midrash, you understand. Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis was the leading sage at the party. And he didn't speak up. And because he didn't speak up at the party, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says, that led to the destruction of the temple. There is a duty to speak up. And I would apply that here. When you're somebody who has standing in a particular area and you see something going on that's wrong, you do have a duty to, to speak up. Now, you could argue that, as we said regarding regular people speaking up, that, you know what, the population's hearing from doctors all the time and they're not listening. What, what's my voice really going to, uh, to change? You can make that argument. You could also make the argument that counseling people in this regard, or let me say it the other way, your silence is not necessarily taken as a statement that their behavior is okay. I'll give you an example from a very different conversation. Question comes up in the realm of psychology. You're a marriage counselor. A couple comes to you for counseling. Their marriage is illegal in Judaism. They're married, let's say he's a Kohen and she was a divorcee. Are you, as a counselor, allowed to offer them counseling to stay together in Jewish law? Or do you have to say, I can't take this case because, as far as I'm concerned, they're not supposed to stay together? What would you say? So, no one wants to go on the record. <laughs> Sorry? Dr. Silverberg says they shouldn't take the case. There are, in fact, halachic authorities who say they're not allowed to take the case. Rabbi Shabtai Rappaport, who um, married the... Married. Right, but the prohibition applies. It remains as for them when they stay together. It's not like they violated it once and it's over. Rabbi Shabtai Rappaport is either the grandson of Rav Moshe Feinstein or married to the granddaughter of Rav Moshe Feinstein. I forget which. He argued that the um, while he's not ideal and he wants the the counselor to to speak up, he's not straightforward about this. Nonetheless, he notes what I brought you in source number thirteen, in which he says the counselor's connection with this couple is not a social connection, and so his relationship with them isn't like the relationship of other people. In the context of his professional work, accepting a given situation as is does not constitute agreement to the reality. And so this acceptance is not interpreted here as approval of the patient's conduct. In other words, you're talking to them as a doctor. You're not talking to them as a rabbi. You're not talking to them as a friend. You're a doctor. It's not the job of the doctor to weigh in on, uh, on this, or as Dr. Ryder put in the chat, not being contracted to apply Jewish jurisprudence. They're not assuming that you're okay with their relationship just because you didn't say anything. The, um, and the argument could be made here that the doctor's silence regarding masks, when the doctor's walking down the street or at Minion and, does, and sees people who are not masked, it's not taken as approval. You could make that, uh, you could make that argument. Nonetheless, I would say, I would say, based on experience, that that's not true. Meaning, I have seen people in, I'm not talking about the marriage case, I'm talking about the minion and masking case. I have seen people comment that, look, 
you know, no one is saying anything, clearly this is acceptable. The um, People have said that about masking in minion environments. And as I said in my disclaimer at the very beginning, I'm not talking about a particular shul. Please don't read anything into it. They, um, I daven in lots of places. But, but I have seen people say, well, look, you know, so-and-so is here and not saying anything. This is an okay thing. This is considered acceptable. This is safe because, and then, you know, the excuse follows. They, um, let's talk practical implementation. Number one, and this is a very important point to me, um, it's important for the doctor to realize that the rabbi may not be able to do anything about this problem, right? Dr. Kirshen mentioned before, maybe you go to the person involved instead of going to the rabbi about this issue. But recognize the rabbi may not be able to do anything about the problem. Rabbis have two roles or two modes when it comes to enforcing halacha. One is active and one is reactive. Active meaning in an institutional setting, they're able to protect the halachic integrity of the synagogue and the community. In an institutional setting, the rabbi can set rules for what goes on in the synagogue. However, when you're dealing with a personal setting, the rabbi becomes reactive. You ask the rabbi a question about your personal activities, the rabbi can give you an answer. If you didn't ask, the rabbi does not have the ability to volunteer his, uh, his opinion. You know, a rabbi can do a lot about um, people who are, let's say, coming to shul without keeping quarantine. Uh, hang on, hang on, Leah. A rabbi can do a lot and say, we don't want people to come here if they're breaking quarantine. That's fine. But what really is the rabbi's authority if people are going to a backyard minion, which involves members of the shul, without, uh, without quarantining? If the people at the minion are fine with it, what's the rabbi's ability to, uh, to, to act out? To act up, I should say, or to speak out. That's what I meant. The, um, a rabbi can make rules. If the rabbi has a simcha, if the rabbi has an event, the rabbi can make rules about it. But what's the rabbi able to do when you're talking about other people's smachot? You take this out of the realm of COVID and it becomes very obvious that the rabbi's role outside of the institutional setting is extremely limited. Leah. Yeah, um, they generally do not. But this is a safety thing, too. Like, could the rabbi, or, or let's say, again, not talking about any shul, let's say a rabbi may say something like, there's way too much talking going on in the women's section. If you want to talk, please leave. Could the rabbi not do the same thing? Anyone who, who is not masking and social distancing, please leave. So I think institutionally, the rabbi can do that. But that's where they, that's where it ends. Meaning, a person says to the rabbi, going back to our vignette, I know people are not careful in the community. You know, the rabbi can make an announcement, put out an email and say, you know, people should be masking and social distancing. But the rabbi has no greater power, um, regarding this to go up to people outside of the institutional setting and say, you should be doing X, than the rabbi does on other issues. The rabbi finds out that there are people in the community who are relying on a kosher supervision that the rabbi feels is substandard. So the rabbi can send out an email saying, you know, this shul does not recommend such and such a, uh, a standard, right? Such and such a, a certification. But watch what happens if the rabbi tries to go up to somebody who's having a barbecue with it and, uh, and warn them about it. Right. Right. So, could the rabbi, I know it's a very delicate situation, um, but could the rabbi not, let's, let's say he knows someone is going to a kiddush club, uh, unmasked, sharing food, and so on. Um, if he still is that person's rabbi, could he still not call him and say, listen, you know how, what our standards are here in the shul, um, 
I've heard this, I don't know if it's true, I've heard this, you know, but if this is the case, you know, you really shouldn't be coming to the money. Right. So, so, or any other show, thank you. The, um, so, understood. Um, but yeah, no, don't, don't send people to other people's shuls if they're on math. Oh. That's not a nice thing. Um, no, but I would go back to my disclaimer from the very beginning. One of my disclaimers was that for practical situations, you, you really need to know the specifics of the case and the answer may be different. A lot depends on the relationship the rabbi has with the person. You know, do they have that kind of connection where that kind of advice is 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 accepted? Um, Dr. Jessen, you were going to say? You're muted. You have to unmute. Uh, about this case, uh, it, it, I, I think I think what you're saying is that the rabbi doesn't have the, the authority to tell the person that you shouldn't go to a kiddush club that's outside the shul. That's up to you. But I think he does have the authority. And if he knows that there's a group of people that are constantly getting together, they're not in the bubble, they're not doing anything, and they're not being careful, why can't he say, you can't come to the shul? That's where I do have authority. You're endangering everyone who's in the shul. So can he, and he can influence their behavior outside, but he should be able to have the authority to bar them from coming to the shul. Yeah, no, I think creating medically sound rules that are enforceable um, is something that a rabbi can do. I don't think naming names is the way to do it. I think I think you need to come up with some kind of standard that can be articulated um, in a clear way. People who daven in minyanim where people are not masked, you know, should not attend. You know, if you have davened at a minyan where people were not masked in the last seven days or whatever it is, um, then don't come to services here. I, I'm not so sure how that would play out in practice, but in theory it can work. I'm just, I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna wrap up this one because there's so much more to talk about. I apologize. Um, Dr. Kirshen is smiling because he looked at my list of five vignettes and knew that I wasn't getting anywhere near all five. Nonetheless, we're gonna do what we can. Um, the, um, the one thing I wanted to add on this point is that having a doctor as a teammate can really help the rabbi in this regard in two ways. Number one, because having a doctor as a public teammate gives the rabbi's words authenticity. It's not just me talking because of some article I read or interview I watched, but I'm working with my medical team. As was noted before, synagogues that have them are better off. Working with the rabbi will also give the doctor's words greater weight, meaning the doctor says to the man in his 80s, don't go to Minyan. The man says to himself, I've been going to Minion since I was 10 years old. The doctor is not going to stop me from going to Minion. If the rabbi says, don't go to Minion, that will carry greater weight. So having them work together can, I think, um, give strength to the words of both of them. Now, if you flip to the back of your sheets, the, um, the very end, I gave you review questions. So the first five review questions relate to what we've discussed so far. I'm not going to go through them now because of time, but they're there on the sheet. I even gave you links to which sources to look at for each one, and hopefully that will help. I want to move to the next question of should a doctor advise a rabbi? The issue of correcting the rabbi. If you take a look at source number 14, you get the vignette. Sam, this was your issue before. The... Um, a family practitioner becomes concerned that the personal practices of a synagogue's rabbi are increasing the likelihood of the rabbi contracting COVID-19 and communicating it to others, as well as inspiring irresponsible behavior in others. What, if anything, should she say to the synagogue's rabbi? Oh, boy. So the, um, go back to what we began with. A non-doctor in this situation... We'll have all the elements we noted above about love your neighbor, instructing others, don't stand by, and all of that. And sometimes you need to protect the rabbi from his own conduct and to protect others whom the rabbi might infect or might mislead. And there's an added element because the rabbi here is what we called before Adam Chashuv, a person of status. Right? We talked about this before and said a person of status has special responsibilities. And in this case, 
the um, the rabbi has a great responsibility because the rabbi's conduct might undermine faith not only in the medical side, but in the halachic side. Take a look, please, what I brought you in source number 15, the Gemara in Moi Katan. Rav Huna said, in Usha, Usha was the place where the Sanhedrin met after they left Jerusalem towards the end of the Second Temple period. In Usha, they enacted that if a chief justice from the rabbinical court goes bad, we don't excommunicate him. We tell him, be honored and remain at home. Just stay home. If he repeats the act, we excommunicate him because of desecration of God's name, meaning you're going to undermine people's faith in the halakhic system by doing this. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. The, um, but this is a major issue. Now, what about kavod harav, the honor due to the rabbi? That's a valid concern, and we're going to come back to that when we talk about implementation. But we have a basic principle which is worth knowing, and I brought it in source number 16. In a case involving desecration of God's name, you don't worry about giving honor to those who are greater. If this is really a concern of Chil Hashem, of meaning undermining people's faith in the halachic system, aside from the concern that we have of people's health, then it's legitimate and appropriate, and even mandate, mandated, that you have to say, I'm not going to hold back because of the honor of the rabbi. And that's a basic point for anybody, not just for a doctor, all the more so for a doctor because of the reasons that we've said before. But this becomes a duty. Rabbi Berman, you were going to say? You're muted, though. Sorry. Um, is there a, a limit to what point, what level of rub you're talking about? I mean, there's been some post scheme who've come up with some suggestions about schools and obeying uh, health standards, etc., that uh, some might say are very dangerous. Yeah, um, you're, you're, you're correct. And I don't think there's a limit. You are, I, I know what you're referring to, obviously. Statements made in Israel about opening school systems. And not just in Israel, but those have made the headlines. Um, and uh, and I, I share the concern um, for the impact it can have. You know, I'm torn a little bit because to a certain extent you need a voice that is pushing and saying, but we need our schools, because you can't let this be a one-sided conversation in which the schools are simply dismissed. But your conclusion has to be a medical one. I'm just, I see your hand, Rose. Just, you know, there, there does need to be a voice like that as part of the, uh, as part of the conversation. Um, the other piece of it, of course, is, and this is something that's bigger than our discussion, but I should mention it at some point. Actually, you know what? It's going to come back anyway in source, in, in vignette number three which is what do you do when the medical information is uncertain? And often the political decisions raise doubts about the certainty of the, med of the medical advice that's being given because some of these rules in Israel and here and everywhere else appear random. And that, that undermines faith in the system. Rose, you were going to say? And actually, to add to your point, there have been articles in the past week saying that the school openings that were expected to be super spreader events have not actually materialized that way. So it is worth noting that, you know, that level of doubt, which we're going to come back to again in vignette number three, the, um, but the, um, I want to talk implementation because implementation on this is really, really important. The, um, you know, do you make public statements if you feel like, um, the, the rabbis are not, uh, are not listening? We talked about excommunication, which is something public. Take a look at source number 17, the Talmud in Menachot, in which we are told, 
if a Torah scholar goes bad, goes bad means personal misconduct. We do not degrade him publicly. Quoting a verse from Hosea as a basis for it, don't say anything. On the other hand, take a look at source number 18, passage in the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. We do not excommunicate an elder unless he has done as Yeravam ben Nevat and his allies. Yeravam ben Nevat was the one who led the breakaway kingdom. After the time of Shlomo HaMelech of King Solomon, his son Rechavam takes the throne, and Yeravam ben Nevat takes the ten tribes of the northern kingdom and splits them off. He causes other people to sin. If this elder is causing other people to sin, as we saw with Yeravam ben Nevat in Tanakh, then you make a public statement. And in fact, the halacha brought in the Rambam and in the Shulchan Aruch follows source number 18, follows source number 16, saying that if it's to protect other people from being led into wrongdoing, then you make a public statement. I'll go even further than that, although I don't think it's warranted necessarily in this situation. I want people to be aware of the laws on the books. The um, source number 18 and source number 19, the Rambam, and then the Tashbet, so Rabbi Shimon ben Semach Duran, talk about removing somebody from a public position, including a teacher, including a rabbi, including a judge, for a pattern of um, carelessness in their professional in their professional rulings. So be aware that that's, you know, th- this is law on the books. Nonetheless, there's a right way and a wrong way to advise a rabbi that he's made a mistake. The, um, if you take a look at source number 21 from the Shulchan Aruch, from the Code of Jewish Law, Rabbi Yosef Karo writes, one who sees his rabbi transgress the Torah should say to him, didn't you teach us our master such and such? In other words, You don't say, Rabbi, you're wrong. You say, Rabbi, what about? You frame it as a question rather than as a declaration. And then Rabbi Moshe Isserlis, the Ramah and the Ashkenazi portion of the Code of Jewish Law, says, and if he only intended to violate a rabbinic law, you still have to protest. Meaning, don't think it's only if it's a a biblical rule, even for a rabbinic rule. And then Rabbi Isserlis goes on to differentiate and say, If it's a biblical thing that you think he's about to violate, speak up even before he does it. Otherwise, wait till afterwards. But either way, you still frame it as a question. It has to be done in a respectful way. I would add to that, realistically, both on a personal level for your relationship with the rabbi and as a matter of respect, it's probably better to find a rabbinic colleague to deal with it. In other words, rather than going to the rabbi directly and saying, I saw that you were in the supermarket and your mask was under your nose, it might be better, depending on the relationship, to ask a rabbinic colleague who's also a shul rabbi. I'm deliberately excluding myself from this conversation um, to be the one to, uh, to deal with it. And then the last point, but I think the most important point in this implementation it's also important to make the correction on the right halachic basis. This is very important. I've seen doctors dealing with these issues say, it's pikuach nefesh. Don't they know it's pikuach nefesh? It's life and death. Therefore, they should. Right? If you say that, you can potentially turn off the rabbi who knows full well that this is an issue of pikuach nefesh. The rabbi cares about saving lives. The rabbi just either doesn't think the medicine is correct, because he's read those who are telling him that the medicine is incorrect, or he thinks that at least it's in doubt. So I think the argument to make to the rabbi is, Rabbi, I know that all medical knowledge is fundamentally uncertain, which we're going to come back to in vignette number three. I realize that. But don't we say to treat suffake pikuach nefesh, doubt regarding saving lives, like vadai, like a certainty? The Gemara in Yuma says that in the event that a building collapses on Shabbos, on Yom Kippur, so we dig through the rubble if there's a chance that there might be somebody under there. Because there's doubt about saving a life, that is considered like certainty. 
So, so too here, the thing to say to the rabbi is not, oh no, it's pikuach nefesh, how could you do that? It's to say, what do we, what is the rule when we have uncertainty about saving lives? You know, I think that's a very important way to frame it because, yeah, otherwise it can turn off the rabbi you're trying to speak to who says, well, I know that. I know pikuach nefesh. Of course it's pikuach nefesh. The, um, the, so that's, I think, you know, important for our second vignette. Um, and I gave you review questions, review questions six and se- six, seven and eight relate to, um, relate to that point. Um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause here, just questions and comments that relate to vignette number two, or can we go to number three, which is about uncertainty? So, so someone sent me a, uh, a question. Um, in the chat, they send it to everyone, so fine. They, um, if you go to a rabbinic colleague, you're giving a third person knowledge as to your concern about the rabbi. If you go directly to the rabbi and he listens, you're limiting the number of people who know about the rabbi's carelessness. That's true, and I thought about that when I, you know, presented the uh, the idea. And if your relationship is really good enough to be able to speak to the rabbi directly, then I would agree with you. They um, then go to the rabbi directly. My concern is that if you don't have that kind of a relationship, then it's not going to be taken seriously. But I agree. You're pointing out something I think that is important to recognize. No one likes to have somebody talking about them to somebody else. The, um, I mean, this isn't Lashon Hara, because this is very clearly in what the Chafetz Chaim considers toeles, a, uh, a benefit that not only justifies but mandates speaking up. Um, but at the same time, I agree with your point that the, um, if you can limit it, if you have a relationship that will allow you to limit it, then yes, um, it's appropriate to uh, it's appropriate to do so. Okay. All right. Let's see vignette number three. We shift now from should a doctor advise a rabbi to how should a doctor advise a rabbi. A synagogue rabbi asks a public health physician whether blowing a masked shofar is safe. There isn't sufficient data to provide a definitive answer. How should the physician advise the rabbi? What if local physicians are conflicted? And it doesn't have to be the chauffeur case. That just happened to be, you know, a big one that came up not so long ago. But you can come up with your own, uh, with your own case. So I think it's important to recognize that halacha is not so rigid that it can only deal with certainty. We have rules for dealing with doubt in every area of Jewish law, right? What bracha do you make on a granola bar, on sushi, on a wrap? There's a lot of uncertainty in all of those areas, which obviously we do not consider to be life and death. But I'm saying that we have precedent for dealing with uncertainty in a case like that, more towards the life and death end. Um, the status of a child born from a Jewish egg donor and a non-Jewish surrogate. What is the Jewish status of the child? There's a lot of uncertainty. Jewish law needs to come up with a way to deal with it. You work with what you have. And that is certainly true when you're dealing with medical halacha. Because, as I already led before, halacha views all medicine as doubtful. All medical knowledge is viewed as doubtful. That doesn't mean unimportant, but it means uncertain. By the way, just recognizing that we have about 20 minutes left, I want to make sure to mention, if you didn't sign in in the beginning, please either put a message to me alone in the chat or just put your name and email address in the chat. If you're getting the emails already, you don't need to put your email address. That means I have it. But your name indicating that you signed in because I can't give the sheer and also record 72 names. It doesn't work that way. The um, So, the um, the idea that halacha views all medicine as suffolk, as uncertain, goes back to a classic Gemara in Bava Kama. I didn't even bring the Gemara on the sheet because we've discussed this Gemara any number of times. The, the Gemara there says, we have a rule when it comes to an assault. Person A assaulted person B. So person A is responsible to pay for all sorts of damages, right? Time lost from work, humiliation, etc. One of the things that they're supposed to pay is medical bills. 
they're required to pay medical bills. The Torah says, Virapo yirape, and he shall surely heal the victim of the attack. Says the Gemara Bavakama Pehe Omid 85b, we learn from this that there is permission for doctors to heal. Since the Torah says, heal him, heal the patient, that must be there's permission to heal. And everybody jumps on that Gemara and says, what are you talking about? Didn't we learn an hour ago, don't stand by while somebody's blood is shed? So of course there's an obligation to heal people. Don't stand by. If somebody is dying, if somebody is is vulnerable, you have to you have to step up. How could you require permission to heal? So Raimoshe Nachmanides, the Ramban, wrote something which Rav Cook expanded upon. I brought you Rav Cook's formulation because it's even more clear than the formulation of Ramban. Ramban, for those who want to look it up, is in Teresa Adam Ian Hasakana Vav. The uh, Rav Cook is right here in source number twenty three on your sheet from his Dad Kohen collection of responsa. And he says, the simple explanation of the words of the sages, and he shall heal. From this we see that the Torah permitted a doctor to heal, indicates that the knowledge involved in medicine is uncertain. Were it clear, how could anyone think there was an obligation to heal? Will one not be violating, do not stand by the blood of another, for not intervening to prevent any trouble which befell a person, even trouble from heaven. Even getting attacked by a lion is from heaven, and yet we are told we have to save people from lions. So too in medical treatment. He says, the, the reason why the Torah has to permit a doctor to treat a patient is because the argument might be, yeah, but I might not help the patient, I might actually make things worse. Because I'm human, and medicine is, as yet, an imperfect science, and therefore I may make things worse instead of making them better. So therefore, Rav Cook says, that's why the Gemara has to say, do it anyway. Heal anyway. You don't know. It could be that when you think that this antibiotic is good for the patient, you're actually causing harm. It could be you think this surgery is good for the patient, and it actually makes things worse. That's possible. Nonetheless, you only work with what you have. And we will rely on that uncertain medicine to break Shabbos and to break Yom Kippur. The doctor doesn't know for sure this patient needs to eat. The doctor doesn't know for sure that giving the patient this food is actually going to help. But that's what we do. We don't let uncertainty be cause not to give guidance. You just give the best guidance you can. And to go back to what I said before, because we're dealing with uh, with life and death, so we say, Safek pikuach nefesh. If you're in doubt about saving lives, that's like vaday. That's like a case of certainty. So that's the basic underlying principle when it comes to how you advise when the medicine is uncertain. So what do we do if the doctors themselves are conflicted? What about where? In fact, I have doctors who say X, and I have doctors who say Y. I have doctors who say, go outside to blow chauffeur. I have doctors who say, put a mask on the end of the chauffeur. I have doctors who say, get the, the Tokayash COVID tested right before Rosh Hashanah. Right? And I have doctors who say, don't blow chauffeur. Right? This year, the first day was Shabbos. The second day is rabbinic. The, um, so, just don't blow chauffeur this year. You can find doctors who will say everything. So what, what do we do? So we discussed this last spring when we had one of our initial COVID classes, when we were talking about um, issues of recommending medications that haven't been proven yet and things like that. And what we said was the following. We said three things. Number one, we said, try to get the greatest expert you can. Go to the greatest expert you can. This isn't rocket science, folks. <laughs> get the greatest expert you can. Take a look at source number 24. Rav Yosef Karo in the Shulchan Aruch, one should not attempt to heal unless he is expert and no one greater is present. Otherwise, you're shedding blood. He says, get the greatest. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to come back to the impracticality of that line shortly, so hang in there. They, um, but number two, if you have different sides among medical professionals... So then what you do is you work with a significant majority. You try to find the significant majority. Rav Yaakov Reicher in the Shvus Yaakov, I brought you in source number 25, dealt with this issue regarding a treatment for a patient. 
And he said, the doctor who's making recommendation to the patient who is in a life and death case should check with local expert doctors and decide based on the majority of views. You see it in source 25, meaning a recognizable majority, which is double, meaning a two thirds. Look for at least two thirds of doctors to say something in order to consider that something to go on. Why two thirds? Because there's concern regarding frivolous people. Not everybody is, uh, is necessarily on the same level and not everybody is as careful. So therefore, take that majority and the agreement of the leading local authority. So now you'll say, well, what are you going to do? You're going to go with the, uh, the greatest expert for every case that comes up? How in the world are you actually going to, uh, to manage this? So Eliezer Waldenberg, who was a leading authority in medical halacha until his passing uh, about 15, 17 years ago or so, was a leading authority in Israel. Many doctors from Shari Tzedek Hospital went to him for, uh, for halacha guidance. He says, if you don't have the option of getting the greatest doctor, so you go with the greatest available authority. You have to take the greatest available authority. Take a look at source number 26. He says, as long as the greater doctor does, have, does not have the ability to treat every local patient, or the patient lacks the financial means of reaching him, any doctor with a diploma who has received certification and permission to treat professionally may treat. Even though there's a greater doctor in the city, this is especially true for known illnesses with well-known and accepted modes of treatment when you're dealing with stuff that, ev- that, that every doctor is comfortable with, so then it's easy. He says, then certainly anybody who has the um, certification can do it. But even if you're not dealing with something that's obvious, even if you're not dealing with something that is known, nonetheless, he says, your your duty is to um, to try to get the greatest you can. But if the greatest isn't available, then you have the shoulders, you have the training, you have the certification. It's your job to call it as you see it. That's the, that's the idea. So every medical professional who is trained and certified is of great value and can reliably present the rabbi with the data, certain or uncertain, unanimous or conflicted, on which to base a, uh, a decision. Is that clear? Is that, uh, is that clear? Um, I gave you two review questions that relate to this. Review questions 9 and 10. Does halacha respect a medical opinion expressed with 70% certainty? I think the answer is yes. And what does halacha look for if the experts are conflicted? So we saw greatness, significant majority, and local, uh, and local authority. The, um, so someone sent me a question privately about weighing in on anti-mask demonstrations. We'll see if there's time for this at the end. Um, I say that knowing full well, there will not be time for this at the end. And feeling pretty good about that. The, um, the, I want to, I want to hit, um, question four. Question four is very important. Unless there are, unless there are medical questions that relate to number three about the uncertain data. Okay. Then let's go to question four. Question four is competing imperatives. Source number 27. An epidemiologist is appointed to lead a synagogue's COVID response team. She feels the synagogue should err on the side of caution, canceling all communal events and admonishing synagogue members to avoid in-person contact with others. The rabbi raises concerns about the mental health of congregants who are more isolated. How should the doctor and rabbi resolve questions when all results entail risk? Right? And this goes back to a point that we made back in the beginning closing, yeah, or not in the beginning, in the middle, closing schools, detrimental for the learning as well as mental health of the students. What do you do when there are risks on all sides? So, you know, as we said regarding uncertain medical knowledge in, uh, in the previous vignette, um, halacha recognizes competing imperatives in every area. And we always need to have systems for dealing with competing imperatives. Right? Someone wants to make Aliyah, but their parents don't want them to. So, competing imperatives. Honor your parents, living in Israel. Someone wants to give tzedakah to a relative who has a drug addiction. Am I enabling addiction by giving? But I have a responsibility to, to help them, and this is my only way to help them. And so on and so on. Halacha has a system for dealing with situations where the risks are to the same group, 
that we're trying to protect, which is what we're talking about. Meaning, let me let me say that differently. There are two different types of cases. One type of case we're not going to talk about now, and that is where helping one group endangers a different group. That's a fun discussion in its own right. But that's not our case here. What we're talking about is medical advice says shut down all your shul programs, and there are members of the shul you are trying to protect by doing that, but they themselves are vulnerable to being harmed as a result because they will be more isolated. So now, what do you what do you do? How do you deal with risks like that? So knowing they have eight, we have eight minutes left, I'm not going to make this a discussion. I wish I could, and it's certainly better to learn that way. Nonetheless, the um, number one core principle: risk taking is justified in halacha. The um, the that's a that's a basic point. Um, the uh, we talk about the Gemara Bava Mitzia Kuf Yud Beis, which says that somebody is allowed to go to work at a job that entails a degree of risk to avoid the risk of starvation. It's possible to make a calculation and say this risk is a bigger risk, this risk is a lesser risk. You can make calculations like that. So, what are the calculations that we're supposed to make? Three different systems. First system, if you take a look at source number 28 from Rav Chaim Odzer, is ask the question of which risk is greater and which risk is lesser. So, Not lesser, excuse me. It's not his question. His question is which risk is negligible? Is it possible that you can ignore one of the risks because it's really non-existent in the eyes of halacha? The, um, he's talking here about a case in which there's a woman for whom pregnancy would be dangerous, and the question of, is she allowed to live with her husband? In a case in which it's exceedingly unlikely that she would conceive. He's dealing with a case that appears actually in the Talmud. And he says, if you're dealing with a case in which the risk is exceedingly low, then you can say, I'm going to do what everybody else does. Shomer Psayim Hashem, God guards people who are foolish, and I'll be okay. I'm not discussing the conception case right now. My point is only the principle that he applies, which is some risks are so low that you're allowed to take them. So I am allowed to go to work knowing that I am going to have to drive for 25 minutes on Bathurst in order to get to work. Yes, there is risk involved. Nonetheless, it's a low enough risk that I can say it's not significant in its own right. The uh, Some may disagree. But that's, um, your, uh, your mileage may vary, if I may pun. The, um, the, that's one. Second, um, argument is, weigh one risk against the other risk. Is one of the risks much lower than the other? So even though neither of the risks is negligible, nonetheless, one of them clearly outweighs the other. So if you take a look at source number 29, Rabbi Arya Lipschitz, the Shem Arya, talks about going to sea in a boat. We know that classically we have looked at traveling by boat as dangerous. A person who comes back from a voyage is supposed to make Berkas HaGomel, is supposed to thank God for saving them from a dangerous situation. So clearly we want to avoid um, that uh, that risk, and yet there is such a thing as making such a bracha. Clearly you, there are cases where you're allowed to go to sea in a boat. So the answer given in the Shem Aryeh, Rabbi Lipschitz, is depends on why you're going. He's writing, keeping in mind, in 19th century Lithuania, he says, going to sea in the Mediterranean, meaning just to wander the world and see new things, it would be appropriate to avoid this. But only to go for livelihood or trade. He says, if I'm weighing the risk of the sea voyage against the risk of um, starvation, because I don't have a means of supporting my family. So starvation's a big deal. And therefore, I'm able to go to sea to try to support my family. Weighed the two risks. The risk of starvation is a bigger deal. However, if it's the risk of boredom versus the risk of, uh, of um, the sea voyage, he's not willing to endorse that. He says, no, then... Be bored. Find another way to entertain yourself. That's his, uh, that's his distinction. So it's a cost-benefit, if you will. 
And then the third approach is the approach of the Binyan Tzia and Rav Yaakov Etlinger, and this is the most fascinating of the three. He says, future risks are weighed less seriously than present risks. This sounds like a psychological statement. We're more concerned about a risk that's right now than about a risk that's in the future. In the event that the threat on one side is only a future threat, then you can push it off for for the uh, for the time being. We don't have time to go into this in depth, unfortunately. This uh, this third approach, but the um, but he says that the um, that in the event that a risk is only a future risk, it has less significance than an immediate um, an immediate risk. Application of that would be, let's say you say the shul wants to close. Um, all events because it's considered hazardous, it's not going to be dangerous to people in terms of their mental health. I'm, I shouldn't make a, med- a medical statement. I'm guessing that it's not going to be, I see we have psychologists on who can speak to this. They, um, it's not going to be dangerous to their mental health if you close things for a few days. Longer term, it may well be. But it could be dangerous to their physical health today if they contract COVID-19 at an event now. So therefore, I might say, let's wait until that other risk becomes imminent before we start expressing concern for that. That would be a uh, a, a potential argument. And we have, we have within Judaism a precedent for saying that you can take some risks in order to, um, in order to benefit in other ways. Um, someone sent me a message asking about the recording. I always send out, not always, I always try to send out a link to the recording afterwards so people can download it and, uh, and by all means you'll be able to share it as well. Okay. So the, um, the, I want to point you to source number 31 quickly. Source number 31. The Rambam in his commentary to the Mishnah in Avot. The Mishnah in Avot says, Ye you ani and b'neve secha. Paupers should be members of your household. Usually, we take that to mean you should invite people who are indigent in and support them. But that's not what the Rambam says. The Rambam says that the Mishnah is telling me that you should hire people who are needy to do work in your house. Give them a job. That becomes very important in latter-day responsa because they talk about cases in which you hire someone to work in your house and they get hurt. you bringing somebody in, you think you're helping him, but you're actually hurting him. And the rule is there's a level of immunity for somebody who gives somebody else a job, assuming you're not careless, assuming you don't put the person actively in a dangerous situation. The, um, you're able to give them that, that parnasa. You're able to give them that living because they need it in order to be able to survive. I brought you an example from the Tzemach Tzedek, the first Tzemach Tzedek, in, uh, in source number 32, where he talks about it. You're not responsible First, what happens to someone who you hired to do a job because you wanted to give them a, uh, a living? And the same thing is going to be true when you're making calculations like this in the, uh, in the COVID situation, which is to say, I'm trying to help them by keeping them safe. It could be there's fallout to it. I have to make my best risk assessment and see what helps them most and what protects them most. That's a calculation that you need to, uh, to make. So a doctor has a great role to play in this, in identifying risks, in quantifying them, and in suggesting ways to mitigate them. So that was the last of the review questions that I had. How does Halacha decide which risk to accept, which we saw in sources 28 to uh, to 30? The, um, the last item that I had was the counseling question. How should a doctor advise a rabbi in terms of what the rabbi should do for the community? I think what I'm going to do with that one is follow up by email. On that, with some thoughts, um, because it's already 11 and I, I never want to hold people um, late. It's an important topic, though, and I want to, uh, I want to, for my own sake, as well as for the group, I want to have that conversation, because I think there's a lot to be said. So I think I'm going to follow up. In the follow-up email, I'll include some items relevant for, uh, for, number, for number five. I'm going to stay on now for questions and discussion. But I don't want people to feel beholden that they have to stay. So if anyone needs to get off, they uh, they may. Um, but I'll stay. I'm, I'm going to stick around for a while. 
So um, for everybody, thank you very much, Dr. Pekas especially. Thank you for helping with the uh, with the accreditation, and um, and I um, I'm going to send out a follow up later. If, again, if you did not sign up, please uh, please make sure that you uh, either message me privately or register in the uh, in the chat. Um, thank you very much. And now I'll stay on for questions and comments.